you ever wonder what the end of the earth looks like? If you do, then I have an immense concern for your view of how the world works and gently encourage you to move away from the flat earth theory and to a more logically sound theory. The idea that the world revolves around me. Now that you have uh, successfully moved yourself towards the more logical conclusion, I would suggest that you like and subscribe now so that you can be closer to nature, me, as the Green Revolution is the only economically viable way forward. <laughs> Distance is tyranny. That is a running theme I have encountered a lot in my life as a Western Australian. It literally pervades the space around this state. Everything is so far away, out of reach, or barely within one's grasp. We are often forced to choose our choice of travel carefully. This is even more so the case when multi is a newfangled thing! And, uh, diseases were a lot more difficult, as in, instead of having to mask up, you just had to fucking die. A lot of die. Spanish flu was very rough. You want a place that's a good example of the tyranny of distance? Then try Mikathera. Known as the end of the earth, Mikathera was a small gold mining town. Located directly on the Great Northern Highway. See my video on that here. <laughs> its gold levels were third rate, never to the degrees of the Kalgoorlie or Victorian gold fields. Certainly not as many gold diggers either. Oh, whoa. <laughs> Quest of cars that call me. But it was respectable nonetheless, as, you know, it established a town. When you think of finality, you don't think of a place like that. But people often do like to make biblical descriptions of things that, frankly, aren't that biblical. Realities can often be just as banal. The end of the earth is often described as a place of foreign extradition, or a pit in which to fall. And those medieval people, in spite of their pig-headed assumptions, their focus on an outfallen Rome, and their dwindling food supplies, had no idea about just how right they were. Because what lies beyond that endless ocean of seas? But... Uh, make it there. You would travel to such a place after all. Except for the most committed bums on earth. Gold Prospect. The only thing that distinguishes them from the lowly gamblers of rural New South Wales is that instead of pulling a lever in a climate controlled room, they are doing immense amounts of strenuous labour in some of the most hot and unforgiving isolated climates on earth. Those people waste away entire lifetimes for what is ostensibly a gamble for gold. Like the Lotus Hotel in the Percy Jackson novels, they don't even realise time going by. There was once a prospector who went to the doctors because he couldn't lift like he used to. He was an 86 year old man complaining that he couldn't lift his 90 kilo friend up a fucking mine shaft. Just for reference, this is 20 kilos. Another 20 kilos. This 80 something year old man was confused about why he couldn't live this much. He was 80! Why take the gamble? Why separate yourself with miles and miles of dirt and dust? For my family growing up, there were many reasons. Sometimes it's to get away from people and the problems they often generate. Sometimes it's the isolation and its power to amend concentration. Mainly though, a person moves up north for the money. Nowadays it's for a wage, but back then it was for gold. When gold is the purpose of a gold town, people consider it above all else. There was once a Sardinian man named Luigi who ended up in Mika Thara's hospital for what is fairly normal condition known as appendicitis which coincidentally was once performed on the Thai Burma Railway by escaping Australian prisoners of war with no medical equipment. The more you know, I love reading. <laughs> what the doctors found in his appendix was a dozen grains of gold. 
Since that operation, people have been looking at him with uh, looks of desire and not of a sexual nature. Well, I mean, maybe sexual. I'm sure a lot of people in Mikathar had an Arumian kink. Yeah, babe. Dig me up with your bloom in my shaft. Oh, yeah. There was talk about melting him down for his gold. Running on the assumption that it wasn't just his appendix that contained the gold, and in fact his entire body was bountiful and full of it. When people started asking Luigi where he intended on being buried, he got a little bit concerned, and went to the sheriff to tell him of his quarrel. The sheriff looked him up and down and went, Could be uh, interesting to know how much gold you think. And uh, Luigi decided that uh, maybe the traditional police officers weren't good enough, so he went full American and purchased a shotgun thereafter. Weird things can happen in a town full of veterans and mining explosives. The common saying is, close enough is close enough. Got that from Borderlands 2 flavor text, you're welcome. More wisdom from the franchise coming soon. One time someone tried to blow up the Mika Thara Roadbull, what nowadays is called councils, with mining explosives. Why they would choose to blow up a road board, which I'm pretty sure back then would have only been responsible for like two roads, one of which was the pub's driveway, I have no idea. Honestly, I built that fucking road straight, but whenever I'm looking at it, it's fucking curvy. How did they find the man who did this? Well, they used something that was uh, the fashion of the time. Aboriginal trackers, known as black trackers, which had the mystical ability of environmental awareness, you know, being able to look at footprints and go, here budge, we can use those footprints to track the person who did this. It's a kind of magic in its own right. The roads stretch long distances, but they are thin. My brief experience over east, the roads there between the capitals were laced with buildings along the way. Never too far away from people. Never too isolated. Few people in the northwest are as accessible. But when you need them, you know exactly where they are. What's well, a mining town without a pub crawl? A 13 year old girl was lacerated by a water bottle, which back then were made of those pansy plastic materials. They're made of materials with real chest hair. See? Real chest hair! Like, asbestosalized lead, probably. She needed a blood transfusion due to the severity of the cut, but there was only one available blood donor in Mikathara at the time. So they called him up and he was happy to go and give his blood. So, all was good, right? Wrong. When they were patching the girl up, they noticed she was uh, yodeling with a lot of mirth and excitement and incoherence, which, although these days would be kind of part of the parcel when it comes to particularly energetic Twitch streamers, was a bit odd back then. Why was she acting like this? Turns out they called upon the blood donor from the pub. She got drunk off blood. Usually children get drunk by stealing people's cruises. But I've never seen a kid game enough to get drunk off of someone's blood. Well, I don't know, I've seen some goth girls who'd probably be pretty keen on it, but I don't think they're doing it for the alcohol, I'll tell you that much. It is said your time in Mikathara is not judged by the amount of years you spend there, but by the amount of summers. A statement that I think is quite pertinent these days to many of the FIFO mining towns, including the one that I grew up in, where people choose their limited opportunities for travel in the summers. The cost of travelling to the nearest centres in WA is high. Even accounting for the lack of jurisdictional boundaries, it is still hundreds of kilometres of distance and dozens of litres of fuel burnt. Reading about Mikathara had me pressing in my head constantly. Something I overheard my mum say a few years back. We're in Albury Wodonga. It was my first and so far only time in the eastern states. A trip tandem in rural Australia to an overseas trip with a price tag to match. We chose this one, 
single trip over east for the first time in over a decade because the father of my mother, my granddad, a man partially responsible for engineering the train tracks of the Pilbara to be appropriately equipped to handle the record-breaking weight of the iron ore trains carrying away the distance-inducing red dirt to foreign shores, had died. A man who I regret to this day in my youthful ignorance, never taking full advantage of his decades of collected technical and likely philosophical wisdom, whose legacy left in me is little more than a train pattern tie and a book on the prisoners of wars of the Thai Burma Railway or which his father, my great-grandfather, endured. I remember overhearing my mum, who would later burst into tears mere minutes later as she carried her father's coffin, confide to another bereaved of the tyranny of distance that separates her from her Victorian family. That tyranny of distance. I will never forget that phrase uttered from her mouth, as I sat in the first family funeral I ever attended but far from the first that was had. There are a few things I am confident I will never forget. My memory is fickle, and the flashes from my childhood fleeting and esoteric. I believe we should be pushing power upon this tyranny, that the narratives of tomorrow must be defined by the gaps we close rather than the holes we dig. There is a true narrative that can be told through the lens of the sand groper's struggle against the dictatorship of distance. An emotional, empty, and tense struggle of being left alone for so long. Whether it was the small gold rush that created the end of the earth, or a simple mining gig. The north has to offer endless dirt down, around, and in your hands.